Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. Patient Eric Berg has had seizures due to epilepsy since he was 12 years old. Recently, he'd had more seizures affecting his day-to-day -day life and his ability to work. With encouragement from his beloved fiance, Tina, Eric sought treatment at Mayo Clinic. Here at Mayo, experts are using a new way to treat seizure disorders called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. This uses a magnetic field to stimulate certain areas of the brain. We are lucky today to have Eric and Tina join us and share their story. Also with us is one of his physicians, Dr. Jeffrey Britton, who is a neurologist and division chair of epilepsy at Mayo Clinic. Eric, it's uh, so nice to meet you. Tell us how your life was like with, with seizures uh, before you had this treatment. You know, it started at 12 years old and um, it was basically never cured or it was never Diagnosed. diagnosed. I was on medication for a long time and it just got to the point where I just dealt with it because it wasn't, they weren't grand mal seizures. And when I had them, they were very short and very, you know, not really life threatening or anything like that. So I just learned to live with them. And one thing that always bothered me was when I was driving, I was always conscious about, you know, if something happens, what am I going to do? And I would always pull off the road. And when I would drive on like through construction. I would avoid construction on purpose because there was nowhere to pull off and I knew that and it would always scare me. And there's a couple of roads around here that have uh, concrete barriers on both sides of it. So I always veered away from that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of things that I dealt with were just, you know, what happens if I go into one of these little fits and, you know, if I'm driving or if I'm doing something, where can I go? What can I do? That's pretty much the only thing that I really had to worry about. And, and since they were so infrequent and I knew when they were coming, um, it didn't seem like a really big deal to me. So I just learned to live with it. So how did you know the seizures were coming? And, and at its worst, how many seizures were you having, say, in a day? Well, before this all started, uh, before I came to Mayo, before March of this year, I was probably having eight to a dozen a year. Basically, how I always described it was is, you know, the nervous feeling you get, butterflies in your stomach, they call it. Uh, I remember I was going to give a speech one time in college, and I had this nervous feeling, and I thought I was going to have a seizure, but it was just the nervous feeling in my body. It wasn't, but it was that same feeling. It wasn't the same every time. The seizures were the same every time, but the, but the feeling I would get could go on for a day. Normally, after I slept, it would go away, and, and nothing would happen. And this must have been very disruptive to your life, uh, I would assume. I remember I, I thought about this uh, I, when I first started, I was 12 and I was in bed and it happened and I didn't, I couldn't recognize what it was. I thought I was falling asleep and I didn't really know what happened. And then it happened again while I was going to sleep one night and I sat up in bed. And I remember I have a train, I always had trains in my room and uh, I looked at my train set and everything was it was double vision and I knew something was wrong but I didn't I still didn't say anything to my mom. Now Tina behind every great person is a it's a tremendous asset and, and that is you in this story can you tell us a little bit about what happened and what led Eric and you to here to Mayo Clinic? His episodes always kind of took me by surprise because we just led a normal life um, from my perspective and all of a sudden you would have one and I'm like oh Okay, but then um, actually it was at the end of April, I was downstairs and I heard him breathing really oddly upstairs and I went up there to check on him and he was just acting, I actually thought he was displaying symptoms of, a, of a having a stroke and I couldn't get him up, I couldn't, he couldn't sit up and that was the turning point in the journey where we realized that we had to, to do something. One day he was eating and he couldn't get the food on his fork, but he just, he could not do it. And I said, okay, that's it. You know, we're, we're going to Mayo. He was very hesitant about going to a doctor and going to a hospital. So I said, we're gonna go straight to the top and got to see Dr. Britton. And um, from that point <clears throat> on, it's just been getting better and better every day. And as you said, that this was during the sort of coronavirus uh, peak, as it were. So obviously, you're naturally nervous about coming to the hospital. But as you know, that Mayo Clinic has done a, a very good and safe way of bringing patients here uh, with all the safety aspects in, in place. Uh, Dr. Britton, can you tell us about the 
typical treatments that somebody like Eric with his seizures would, would traditionally have? The mainstay of treatment for seizures is uh, medication therapy. Uh, the medications uh, uh, dampen nerve cell excitability uh, in an effort to prevent them from generating a, a seizure. Of course, the brain is electrically active. It's supposed to be, otherwise it wouldn't work. But if it gets hyperactive, seizures can occur. So uh, the medications available help kind of put the brakes on the, on the nerve cells to prevent uh, that uh, from occurring. But unfortunately, because uh, the seizure medications put the brakes on nerve cells, they can have uh, side effects. They can cloud a person's uh, you know, mental status. Uh, they can affect memory. They don't just specifically work on seizures, they affect other neurologic functions that you want to have also. So the side effects can be a problem with uh, medications. And Eric, did you experience these side effects with the medications? I, I would say yes, I, I have experienced some heavy duty uh, side effects, irritability for sure. Um, and it's, it's actually, I've noticed that it's kind of the same time of day, even uh, around five, six o'clock, I seem to get very irritable. Um, and Dr. Britton, what was it about Eric's case that you thought that RTMS would be applicable here? Fortunately, seizure medications help two thirds of people with seizures. In two thirds of people with seizures, it's all you need. Uh, to keep control. But one out of three will have incomplete control, and some are just nearly resistant to the seizure medications that we currently have available. So if you consider three million people in the U.S. have seizures or epilepsy, a million, that means a million have seizures that are not completely controlled or inadequately controlled with the medications that we have available. So other treatment options have been developed over the years to try to address that population. One key a treatment is surgery. In people who have seizures coming from one part of the brain consistently, surgery to remove that part of the brain, if it can be safely done without causing neurologic problems, can be very effective in controlling seizures. Other treatment modalities also include stimulator therapies, electrical stimulation, uh, such as a deep brain stimulation, device called responsive neurostimulation therapy uh, and vagus nerve stimulation therapy. Also, uh, uh, dietary therapy can sometimes be used uh, to treat seizures. Uh, Mayo Clinic, a diet called the ketogenic diet was developed back in the 1920s uh, and was found to be effective in helping uh, to treat uh, seizures. And probably a third of people are helped out significantly with ketogenic diet. It's chiefly used in young children. Uh, Spinoffs of the ketogenic diet like Atkins diet or the low, uh, diet called the low glycemic index diet uh, can also be utilized. Those are the therapies. And then there's a rare patient who may have a specific genetic cause for their epilepsy in which very unique treatments are, are needed, but those are fairly exceptional. Eric was found to have a, a growth in the back left uh, part of his brain. And at the end of the day, we've decided this looks most in keeping with the type of growth called focal cortical dysplasia, uh, which is a fairly common cause of medically intractable focal onset epilepsy. Uh, there was some concern, could it be a tumor or some other pathology? But ultimately, it looked most like a focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, so initially when I saw him, I was actually wondering if we were going to need uh, to consider surgery uh, for this lesion. It was in a part of the brain that I knew if we operated on it, would put him at risk of developing a visual loss off in his right side of his visual field. Also, it could potentially have led to apraxia, which is difficulty controlling the right hand. Like if your brain wants you to use a tool with the right hand or to write or do something else, even though you have strength in the arm, you can't quite get the fine motor information to the hand to do that. And there could be some potential impairment of reading and possibly speech. So we had concerns about how realistic uh, surgery would be. I admitted him to our EEG monitoring unit. It was very clear he was having very frequent seizures, about 12 an hour. They fortunately were not leading to convulsions, but they're clearly 
the snowball was rolling down the, the hill at that point. And we tried a ver various intravenous acute three treatments to try to stop the seizures and uh, they weren't working or were partially working. We're very fortunate here that we have uh, really a, a world recognized neuromodulation program for movement disorders and now it's emerging for treatment of seizures and epilepsy. And I talked to one of our colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Brian Lundstrom, uh, who's a key figure in developing these uh, treatments for patients with epilepsy about what we can do. And he thought um, Eric would be an excellent candidate for transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we uh, initiated that treatment and Dr. Lundstrom deserves the credit for uh, putting this together and gave uh, Eric a, a five treatments, a treatment a day for five days. And there was a noticeable reduction in seizures that occurred even in that, the initial few days of, of the treatment. And there's a precedent in the literature of other investigators uh, indicating transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation had been used successfully in some cases for uh, uncontrolled seizures we call status epilepticus. Uh, so there was some precedence out there in the literature and the small numbers of patients over a number over a few years. Uh, so we thought this is a treatment that would not had a very low chance of harming. So how exactly does it stop the seizures uh, from happening? I think biologically we don't fully, no one pretends to fully understand this. But I think intuitively it's almost like you're subjecting the brain to a very strong pulse of magnetic stimulation and it just disrupts the neurophysiologic electrical activity that's occurring at that time. You can actually induce seizures ironically with magnetic stimulation. Uh, when it's used to treat depression, that's a risk that you counsel patients about that you could produce a seizure. So this magnetic field does have an effect on the electrical properties of the brain. In his case, I think his seizures were so frequent, it almost imposed a, like a reboot of that part of the brain. And I think it just stalled the, the seizure pulses that were occurring long enough that they lost their head of steam and then quit creating this ongoing cycle that was going on uh, about every 10 minutes uh, in its case. So would you say then uh, that this is a, a treatment or is this a cure uh, for, for Eric's condition? In his situation, it's had a very long, durable effect. Ultimately, though, I would consider it a treatment. People end up needing to come back for maintenance uh, treatments. The exact frequency at which you should do that or need to do that is really undefined at the present time. So just like any newer treatment, or technology, we have a lot more to learn about it. We brought Eric back uh, for a, uh, you know, a tune-up, so to speak, uh, about a month ago, and that went very well. And Eric, how, how are you doing today now, Eric? Fantastic. It's an amazing thing to have to be the first to, to try something that you know, didn't hurt me at all, you know, and then come to find out it seems as though it's cured me. I mean, there's no, I've had no nothing since June 24th. So that's phenomenal. I came, I walked in the door having approximately 200 seizures a day and I'm now seizure free as far as I can see. Truly is. A, it's just an amazing story to hear and, and how many patients potentially can benefit from something like this. Uh, it really is remarkable. And thank you for sharing those, those wonderful words. Tina, what, what have you experienced? Eric's back at home now, you know, says from since June 24th, uh, everything's been going well. How, how have you seen things change? It's definitely been a journey and every day is, is getting better. Um, and pretty soon all of side effects will, will subside and we'll get back to a completely normal life. Uh, Dr. Britton, anything else you'd like to share with us? For anyone watching this, I just want to get the word out that there are many emerging treatments, thankfully, for seizures. <clears throat> Advances are occurring over time. Um, I'm saddened to hear Eric wasn't even considering going to a doctor, uh, you know, when his, his uh, seizures were spiraling out of control. Uh, that's terrible. You know, I, I just worry there are other people out there who 
are uh, in the same mindset or leery about even seeking help, that's uh, sad to hear. Uh, so I'm hoping stories like this will uh, encourage people to seek uh, medical care for these problems, to find out what all of their options are. And if they're not hearing something to their satisfaction, they really need to probably proceed trying to get an appointment at an epilepsy center somewhere uh, to get people who have been around the block many times with the different treatments available and uh, who are in a position to bring novel therapies uh, to their uh, care. Eric, Tina, anything else you'd like to share with us? I, I want to back up what Dr. Britton said in that I am was probably even at 50 to 60 seizures a day, knowing that still was hesitant, you know, and, and, and it wasn't till, you know, my motor skills started going that I realized that we need to do something because I was starting to get scared that something was happening to my brain. I didn't know what was, I didn't, you know, they, they're not going to stop by themselves. I knew that. And I knew the medicine that I was on wasn't working clearly. And I highly recommend anyone with a problem of any kind to go to Mayo Clinic. The, the staff is really, I mean, I knew it was going to be good, but they were, they even exceeded my expectations. Our thanks to Dr. Jeffrey Britton, a neurologist and division chair of epilepsy at Mayo Clinic for joining us today. And more importantly, Eric Berg and his fiance Tina for sharing their story. Thanks so much. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.